Warning. Censorship. Warning. Censorship. Warning. Censorship. Oh, I'm looking pretty pixely. <laughs> good afternoon, uh, good morning, I guess, and good evening, everybody. Um, this is the Rebel News Daily live stream. Um, it's hosted by me, Sheila Gunn Reid, today, and my guest host is Lewis Brackpool, our UK contributor. Lewis, I'm looking very pixely, but you are looking great. How's it going? <laughs> oh, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, everything's okay. Not not too bad on my end. How are you? Oh, I don't know. We're having internet difficulties out here in the wilds of northern Canada, but we'll figure it out. Um, I sh oh. Oh. oh, oh, sorry. Thing I things are really, really, really bad here. Um, anyways, I should tell everybody what we're doing while I'm still able to broadcast. Um, this is the Rebel News Daily live stream. It's hosted, uh, it used to just be hosted on Fridays by Ezra Levant, but then the pandemic struck and nobody could travel, but there was more news than ever, so we thought this is a good way to talk about it with everybody, sort of spontaneously as it happens, and react. And it used to be a great way for our viewers to support the work that we do on YouTube through something called a Super Chat, but then Biden got elected and Big Tech didn't have to pretend anymore, and so they completely demonetized uh, so many conservative platforms, including us. So, um, the moral of the story being, we are becoming more resilient in spite of that soft censorship by broadcasting on three other platforms, Odyssey, Rumble, and Super U. They describe themselves as neutral platforms, and that's great because I don't want them to agree with me politically. I just want them to agree to leave me alone. And so far, so good over there. And they also have different ways there where you can support the work that we do through a Rumble rant, a Super U shout, uh, and an Odyssey hyper chat. And so that's a great way for our viewers to connect with us, drop us a couple of bucks, a little bit of money. Uh, Mr. Producer AD will send those uh, chats to me on um, a message and we'll read those and address them on air. Um, and uh, there will co come a time on the show today that we will have to sort of sign off of YouTube. We start off on YouTube, but we don't say goodbye to our viewers. We invite them to continue the conversation with us over on one of those other neutral platforms. So YouTube is really strict about the things that we can and can't talk about. It's one of my biggest stresses in a day is making sure that we don't publish something that will have the channel destroyed. I don't want it to be me. I always kind of thought it would be David Menzies, but now apparently that's my job at the company <laughs> is making sure YouTube, we don't uh, self-destruct on YouTube. So that's uh, what we're doing here today. And uh, Mr. Producer reminded me just before we went on air that we should give a quick shout out to our podcast listeners because apparently there are thousands of you who watch or listen to us in that way and catch up with us. Um, and I think that's phenomenal. We always sort of forget about you guys, but you know, thanks for that. Uh, I prefer to listen to my news and podcast form. Um, I'm just happy to hear that I am not uh, all that abnormal. So that's great. <laughs> this is, is my pixelation as annoying is my pixelation as annoying for everybody else as it is for me? I really, really dislike it. Um, maybe, Mr. Producer, what do you think? Should I try to call back in and just let Lou do this that. on his own? Yeah, yeah just okay. leave me here Let's... with it. <laughs> okay. That's fine. I'm going to say bye, but I'll be right back. <laughs> Louis, you got sure. it from here. No problem. <laughs> No worries. Well, we've got an exciting show today. We're going to be going through a lot of things such as China. We're going to be talking about Matt Walsh's appearance as well and Dr. Phil last night. And of course, we've got some COVID stuff to talk about, especially with some new re newly released data from the UK. So we've got a very, very exciting show today. Um, I'm going to wait for, of course, Sheila to come back and, uh, and then we can get things rolling. Um, but I'm looking forward to it. And if you didn't catch Sheila as well, we're going to be uh, reading out your comments on the live stream as well, because I think that's very, very important um, as well to connect with all of you guys who send in your, your lovely comments. So I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, reading some out or Sheila, I'm sure will be reading some out as well. Um, I don't know if the producer can hear me is, uh, is, is Sheila on her way back? Okay, cool, no problem. 
Cool. Well, let's let's kick off with the first story, and we'll let uh, we'll let Sheila take over. Um, so we're going to start with China is accused of kidnapping thousands and thousands of people. So if we'd like to bring up the the first story, just so that we can have a quick look. So China accused of secretly kidnapping and repatriating. Um, sorry, the 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 text has just gone a bit strange. I think originally. I don't think originally. Ah, perfect. There we go. Kidnapping and repatriating runaway dissidents to imprison. Now, as we know, China, I believe, is one of the biggest um, threats to the West and the Western world because they own so much. So it's no, it's no surprise, in my opinion, that we're seeing this kind of thing come out from China. Um, could we go back to the um, to the article, if that's all right, just so I can have a quick look at that? Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, China said they were captured for economic cri crimes, but Beijing is accused of targeting lawyers, dissidents, bloggers, journalists, uh, Tibetans, Uyghurs, and Hong Kongers as well. Um, pretty scary stuff. Pretty scary stuff. And we've got Sheila back, and you're looking as lovely as ever without all the pixelation. Welcome back, Sheila. Oh, well, thank you. Thanks, Lewis, for taking the wheel there for a second. Um, I don't know Absolutely. what's going on. <laughs> uh, it's gravely <laughs> cold here, so maybe that affects the internet. But um, yeah, why is this any surprise to us that China is mm. doing all these things? This is like news that we already know. I, But this goes oh, more to our point that we were making the other day. Why are we participating in these genocide Olympics that are coming right up? Any journalist that goes over to cover it is going to be seriously surveilled. Any athlete that goes there to participate is going to be surveilled. Um, they do this to their own people. They're snatching them and bringing them home. Yeah. What are they going to do to prickly Canadian journalists who may have been unkind to China in previous coverage? Uh, th it's just yeah. dangerous. I don't understand the risk. Uh, as I said the other day, this feels like Hitler's Olympics, where it was just a big um, propaganda operation. Um, we've got the concentration camps are back. The, you know, the human experiments are back. Why are we doing this thing for China? I don't understand any of it. Yeah, absolutely. And like I was saying, China own a lot of, of the world uh, at the minute, especially the West in, in places like energy um, and, and lots of different uh, aspects. So it's no surprise that they, they have a lot of control over um, big le legacy media outlets as well. So no wonder only a tiny proportion of people in the West, journalists in the West, are actually sticking their neck out to, to cover mm. Uh, what's been going on out there. So, yeah, like you said, it, it's no surprise seeing this from China. And I think we're going to see a lot more stuff unravel during 2022, I believe. Uh, maybe we can jump ahead to the next story from Blacklocks AD. It's about Xinhua. Uh, I think I'm saying that right. They are seeking a parliamentary press pass in Canada. So access to our House of Commons, close quarters with our journalists. Um and not yesterday, but I guess it would be the day before, media directors of the Parliamentary Press Gallery met behind closed doors to consider membership for Xinhua, the official propaganda agency of the Chinese Communist Party. The press gallery had wow. said it had not discussed the matter with the prime minister's office. This is a huge security threat, but I think it's interesting that the parliamentary press gallery is even considering allowing Xinhua in because they don't allow us in. They don't allow Rebel News in. Yeah. They say that we are not real journalists, but they're actually giving some hmm, serious consideration to Xinhua, the um, spy agency that masquerades as a journalist agency um, on behalf of the CCP, which is, you know, a genocide state. Yeah, it's gross. absolutely. And I'm sure they're not going to be showing uh, pictures of Winnie the Pooh. I think that's banned as well, because you're not allowed to do that, are you? <laughs> No, you're not. Um, and, you know, I, I don't even understand the interest that Ch that China has in coming to cover the Canadian Parliament since um, there's this new report out, I think it's in Yahoo News, about how much China doesn't actually like Canada. And this is like, I, I think it's not the Chinese government, but the Chinese people generally don't like Canada. 
um, <laughs> Canada, once a hot travel destination among Chinese people, has become China's least favorite country, according to a recent survey from state, well, state-run news, Global Times. Everything's state-run. Why do they have to preface it with that? Why, <laughs> if, if it's coming from China, I'm just going to assume that the state is involved. Um <laughs> The poll conducted by Global Times Research Center with market survey firm Data 100 gathered 2,148 responses across 16 Chinese cities from December 5th or 10th to 15th, 2021, showed Canada at the bottom of the ranking with only 0.4% of respondents saying they like the North American country. Um, this actually doesn't surprise me. Um, as we were talking in the meeting preparing for this, um, I think they they know they can walk all over Justin Trudeau. So I think they kind of, I don't know if they, I, I wouldn't say they like him. They definitely don't respect him, but they know he's mm. a good, I, I don't want to say asset, but that might be the right word. But in Canada, we have a very strong, vocal Chinese immigrant community who came here mm -hmm. for freedom and they are very critical of the Chinese government. They are the ones saying, Justin Trudeau, you've got to get harder on them. We've got to stop our um, uh, some of our uh, citizenship policies where you just have to be born here to be a citizen because there's a real problem with anchor babies from China being born in the lower mainland of British Columbia. It's a real big problem. Um, and so they are the ones that show up at Conservative Party of Canada conventions saying, we need to bring in this policy that cracks down on China and this one, and we need to ban Huawei, and we need to call the what's happening to the Uyghurs a genocide. A lot of that rumbling is coming from the Chinese immigrant community. Um, and so I, I get why China is prickly with Canada about that, because obviously they would just like us to stick all those people in a camp and shut them up. But yeah. we don't do that around here. We only do that to pastors. <laughs> yeah. And the unvaccinated soon. <laughs> but, um, yeah, but uh, I think it's no surprise, really. I mean, it's good to see um, that the that the strong um, uh, voices are coming from uh, people who obviously lived through um, the, the, the horrors over in China and decided to make that, um, that journey across to the West, to the free West, as we call it, although it's up for debate now whether it's becoming... Uh, free or not at the minute, but um, that's a different subject. But yeah, it, it, it goes to show that um, the people who are who are projecting this, um, the idea that of course China is this this big, um, nice, friendly um, sort of unit that is there to to to, to cohabitate with the with the, the West is, um, is is shocking, and I can only see that as just pure media propaganda now. Um, from state China media and, of course, collaterating with the Western media, if that made sense. I just, it's just shocking to me that you, you, all of this evidence of the Uyghurs, of how China's big influence on the West is, is so out there, it's easy, you can easily find it, you can see all this information, yet people are still very, very silent on it. When I went to COP26 and there was... Um, there was some protesters outside protesting against the Chinese regime and spoke about the Falun Gong um, tribe who had been massacred over there that nobody really had heard of. But they were the only ones preaching about, how, well, not preaching, but explaining to people about the horrors of this regime and what they've done. And then I speak to, to someone else and say, should we criticize China? And their immediate reaction is no. And, uh, you know, China's our friends, China's, you know, we, we should be looking out for them um, when they don't actually understand all the horrors that have been happening with this regime over the, over the years. And it's going to continue to, um, to expand. Um, but people need to start having these conversations. It's and they are tricky, but I think it's a very, very important one. Well, and it's interesting because so much of the opposition to China is coming from ethnic Chinese people, Hong Kongers, uh, mm. people in Taiwan, the Chinese expat community mm. who escaped and did immigration right. You know, they came in the front door and <laughs> waited their turn. Yeah. Um, you know. But when you, if you got all your news from the mainstream media, any criticism of the Chinese government is often painted as anti-Chinese racism. But when you point yeah. to the people who are actually 
doing the criticism of China, they're ethnic Chinese. It's the worst form yeah. of gaslighting. And it's funny that you mentioned yeah. the Falun Gong because I was reading the Epoch Times today. And uh, China just, Beijing just sentenced a Falun Gong practitioner to eight years in prison ahead of the Olympic Games. And you're not going to hear anything about this in in the mainstream media. No. You're not going to hear about um, any diplomatic pressure being put on China for what they're doing to the Falun Gong. They mm. harvest their organs. They harvest yeah. the Falun Gong's organs. And this is not like a conspiracy theory. This is something that they do. They see the Falun mm. Gong as subhuman um, that are just mm -hmm. uh, like a natural resource that somebody else can use. It's awful. And we don't say a word in the Western world. We just let them get away with it because we need our electronic components and our cheap clothing from Sheen. And <laughs> well, here's the thing with that as well. I mean, you, you touched upon um, that when when you try to criticize uh, another country and their regime, you're met with the same sort of silly arguments of, Oh, that, that means, uh, you know, oh, you must be racist then for criticizing China or criticizing this country or that country. But like you said, the main people who are speaking about it are eth ethnically Chinese who have li lived through the horrors and have firsthand experience of how the regime works. So I think people need to snap out of this idea of just because you, you're criticizing something doesn't mean that you're automatically this bigoted, horrible person. And I think society in general needs to just get over that we should hold people accountable for actions not not based on you know creed or ethnicity it's based on actions and ideology i think that's the main well, thing yeah and i criticize china so much because i want the mm. chinese to be free exactly. <laughs> you know, I'm, exactly i want the chinese people to be free of their horrible government Ideally, they're they're yeah. the first per people persecuted by the Chinese government. So a lot of my criticism is not only directed at what China is doing to the rest of the world, but also equally what China is doing to its own people. This is, I mean, mm. yeah. Anyway, yeah. I could talk about how it's bad sad. China is all the time. I could devote a whole show to just how awful um, China is and what a threat they are to the security of the world and the health of the world, by the way. But we should move along mm -hmm. because— um, you're in the UK, so you know uh, what a plague the state broadcaster is, what a burden it is on the taxpayer, how unwatchable it is. Although I think more people probably watch the BBC than the statistical rounding error of Canadians who actually consume CBC content, even though we have these Canadian <laughs> content laws. Um, now the Liberals, who uh, are just in love with the concept of the CBC, the completely unwatchable CBC, they've decided that they're going to modernize the CBC um, by making the public broadcaster less reliant on advertising, which is literally the old model of the CBC. <laughs> so I don't know how that's bringing it into the like 21st century by doing the things, more of the things we've done for the last 70 years. But it's weird how they've made the word modernize interchangeable with subsidize continue to subsidize Ooh. um and again it's completely unwatchable of course it can't be reliant on advertising how do you sell advertising with those viewership numbers when you're like oh you know like uh, across the entire country of 34 million people a small town in alberta is the population that watches the six o'clock news in uh, of cbc their flagship news so i don't know how, how would you sell advertising with those viewership numbers? You're not reaching anybody. If you're selling ad do, ads based on reach, you have no reach. So, mm. yeah, and and it's interesting because you're seeing a you're seeing a different shift as well with with legacy media. I mean, for example, in the UK, they they are now talking about freezing. Um, uh, funds for the BBC and getting rid of the TV license. I don't know if, if you guys have a similar thing where you have to pay your TV license in order to, to watch the BBC and they come round your house and knock on your doors to make sure that if you even have no. a TV... Do you, not, do you not know about this? That we have to pay a TV I, license every year? Well, I knew about it, but I never really knew that they like come and door knock you for your TV yeah. license money. What happens if you yeah. don't pay? 
oh, they try and find you and they try and they, they can try and like lock you up for it. It's nuts. Um, yeah, it's, it's really bad. So, um, obviously you have the right to say, get off my property. Oh, there, there it is. License fee freeze will hit programs. BBC director general says, yeah, because how it works is you have to pay a TV license every year over here. Um, and that means that you can watch live television. You can watch the BBC, ITV, X, X, Y, and Z. Um, but it's, it's predominantly the BBC and, they've <laughs> so we've been a lot of people have been campaigning to scrap this license fee because it it, it targets people like pensioners who just want to watch tv um what is that i thought i saw there 159 pounds per year what is that in canadian pesos mm. that's a lot I'm of money sure. to watch a lot of money. watch nothing yeah like what and do you watch on the, the bbc the coronation street pretty much yeah <laughs> emma dale eastenders i don't watch them I think my parents do, but you know that's that's their own call. But um, yeah, two seventy, yeah, two seventy a year. Um, so yeah, it, it's funny we're we're seeing this shift. I mean, it's it's a very outdated model. Um, and of course, the fact that people can come to your house, knock on your door, and be like, "He's got a TV. You must watch live TV. Uh, you don't pay a license fee." Um, yeah, get off my property, mate. Like, you know, like, it's it's ridiculous. So. I'm I'm glad that they're looking into that, but yeah, it's it's a weird thing. I didn't know you you didn't know about all that. I didn't know how. I just knew that there was a license fee, but I don't. I maybe thought it was like, you know, a cup like added onto your taxes, couple of bucks a month. That's how we support the CBC. They just the government just gives just gives them money and and it, we just assume it's coming out of our taxes. They're like, here's a billion and a half dollars a year for to make something completely unwatchable. Um, yeah. I didn't realize that you have to pay a license fee to watch live TV. Yeah. By the way, it's, who it's still watches like, live TV? What year is this? Is this 1997? <laughs> exactly. It's just ridiculous. Yeah, you, when, you, when you go to move into a property, you pay your council tax, you pay all your bills, like your water, electricity, and then your TV license. So that's a separate one. So yeah, that must that looks like it's blown your mind, Sheila. Uh, I'm, I yeah. I just can't even believe this. And and like in a day and age <laughs> where, like Netflix, all these streaming services, yeah. ad supported yeah. streaming services like Tubi, Apple TV. Yeah. You know, if you, I don't remember the last time that I went actually out of the house to watch a movie, also because I don't want to participate in the vaccine passport system, but things come directly to Google movies. So I just buy them there and I can watch them whenever I feel like, and this like, it's so outdated. It's like they, they've never met someone who actually yeah. watches TV in the last 10 years. Shocked. Yeah. Yeah. It's absolutely nuts. Yeah. It, it's, it's absolutely nuts. So yeah, a lot of people have been campaigning for the defund the BBC. That's it. Yeah, I've seen – hang on, I've seen this before. I can't see the caption. But, um, yeah, you pay your TV licence, and um, this is all that you get. It's just, yeah, iPlayer, services, Scotland, online, CBBS, all the radios, Parliament. And it's like, really? It's uh, yeah, so I'm in favor of scrapping the, the TV license. It's outdated, it's ridiculous. So it's interesting you talk about modeling the the, the CDC. So uh, yeah, that's that's tied in really nicely, that one. That blows my mind. Now, let's move along <laughs> because there's a pair of pair I'm just I'm so shocked that you have to pay all that money for all that unwatchable garbage. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh Speaking of like getting into the next century, there's a new generation of U.S. politicians coming up, and I'm, I think, probably a generation older than you. I think I have a son that's pretty close to your age. Um, cool. So I feel like um, I understand what the young people are all about, but I don't know, because just saying that made me feel <laughs> old. But <laughs> um, there's a whole uh, new slate of kind of youngish people election ads and we've got this one on cannabis reform which uh let's watch it together i haven't seen this yet every 37 some seconds someone is arrested for possession of marijuana since 2010 state and local <laughs> police have arrested an estimated 7.3 million americans for violating marijuana laws over half of all drug arrests black people are four times more likely to be arrested for marijuana laws than white people 
States waste $3.7 billion enforcing marijuana laws every year. Most of the people police are arresting aren't dealers, but rather people with small amounts of pot, just like me. I'm Gary Chambers, and I'm running for the U.S. Senate, and I approve this message. Gary, I don't think that's a small amount of pot. You're smoking a big hog's leg in your ad. What did I get <laughs> Unbelievable. Unbelievable. I think it's, it's sad that immediately um, it was all made about race. Immediately. I, 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 think, I, just, I don't know. That's just... I don't know. I've got I've got no words really. I've I've got no words to say. Sheila, what what is your what what's your take on on um on that policy legalization? What's your take? I've never asked you that. It's been legalized in Canada for I don't know mm -hmm. a few years. I've sort of given up caring on it. Um, I yeah. I do think that. Um, the government has handled it very poorly, as the government tends to do with all these sorts of things. For example, where I am, they have these regulations where you have to black out the windows, even though, like, the outside is all, like, oh. cannabis shop, cannabis shop, marijuana leaves, but you, they don't want the public to be able to see into inside the store. And I, mm. they say it's for security reasons, but the flip side has happened, where it's really easy to rob a cannabis store because... Nobody can see the robbery happen. You just go in, rob the place, and walk back out. Um, nobody can see, like, <laughs> the guy with the gun pointed at the, at the person at the counter. And I, because of how it was first introduced and how it was sort of left up to the provinces to decide how they're going to legalize and manage it and tax it, um, in where I am, Alberta, we're sort of like the Wild West with some of this stuff, but still even the government being involved um, the government was selling cannabis, um, like, direct to mail, and they lost a bunch of money on it because they were competing with these stores that were just literally everywhere. You could throw a rock in any direction, hit a cannabis store, likewise with liquor stores. So I'm happy that, you know, there's all these pop-up entrepreneurs, I guess, now. I've, I've never I've never even done uh, marijuana. I just don't care. I made it this far in my life now. I'm just going to keep on going. I'm not even interested. Um, but just the, how the government rolled it out and then the government lost money selling mm. marijuana is the perfect synopsis mm. of everything that's wrong with the government, right? And then they taxed yeah. it. it made, they made it more expensive. They certainly didn't put the local weed man out of business, the guy, <laughs> the, the dial a doper guy, because the government taxed it so much. So, I mean, I guess you can get different products now. And so there's, you know, it's sort of like a cornucopia of things marijuana now, which is, I guess, interesting if you're into that kind of stuff. And the weed man just had his couple of strains that he sold you in a baggie so i guess it's a little different um but uh, i don't know i i just don't care but i did think it was interesting that this guy this is his ad now is just look at how cool i am i'm sitting in a field yeah. like i said Sparking smoking up. a hog's a smoking a hog's leg where he was he's like you know people like me with a little bit of marijuana and i'm like what that, that's not a little bit that, like, that's, a, that's a fair bit <laughs> <laughs> I just, I don't Gosh, know. Cool. Yeah, I, know. <laughs> I, I mean, it's creative, I guess. Very creative. Yeah. Um, I believe, I believe we're moving on now to the uh, the cringy ad is is what it's called. Um, yeah. So let's have a little react to this. What is going on? <laughs> was, What's wrong with these communications people? We should ban all politicians from TikTok. I've never seen a good one. Yeah. What is this? Well, who's got Heelys on, really, at this at this sort of at this time? Again, was that, what year is this? Was that was that there was that literally an ad to for that was his for, TikTok. Sorry. He's going in to stop the Republican agenda. I don't know. You're wearing Heelys. Anybody could stop you. They just Roll you backwards. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it is politicians using memes, isn't it? It's just no. You're not good at I it. I mean, the only no, they're not. I'll tell you who the one politician, the two politicians actually that I thought used memes to their advantage was Trump. I think he sure. was very, very good at doing that. 
And um, yeah. uh, Gozar um, is his name. I, I forgot his his first name. Gozar, I think I believe his name in the US. I've been seeing yeah. he's been he's been doing some good. Um, He's a dentist. Memeing for a, <laughs> he's a dentist. I didn't know that. He is. Um, yeah. But everyone else, no, you can't do it. It's banned. <laughs> the all well, particularly the left. Like this just re- reaffirms yeah. my position that the left can't meme. They're not good mm-hmm. at it because they're not funny mm-hmm. because they're too busy policing comedy and telling you what you can and can't laugh at. So naturally they can't even produce a meme or a picture or a TikTok That's even like <laughs> caused me to crack a smile on the side of my face because it's just stupid. It's just, it's not interesting because they're so I, unfunny. I was just more confused. Yeah. yeah. I was just more confused at that. Cause I was like, hang on a minute. Is this the advert? So, you know, it, it goes to show yeah. you, doesn't it? Are you selling me your politics or your shoes? I can't tell. You know, and I should be able to tell. <laughs> I remember when Haley's came out as well. Yeah. Uh, something very exciting happened yesterday. I very rare. Well, no, that's not true. I was going to say I very rarely watch Dr. Phil, but sometimes I watch it like it's a train wreck and it's sort of on in the background when I'm working because I work from home. Um, but Matt Walsh of the Daily Wire <laughs> was on there yesterday and I watch Matt religiously. I listen to Matt all of the time when I'm on the treadmill and he was on Dr. Phil yesterday because as some of you may or may not know, Matt Walsh is a celebrated best-selling LGBT children's author. And, um, he went on Dr. Phil to talk about transgenderism and the forced use of somebody else's pronouns and, um, medical interventions on little kids And, um, you know, he really knows his stuff. He gives a lot of talks on this stuff. And um, I really, I kind of like how the left loved his LGBT children's book until they actually figured out what it was about. And Johnny the Walrus, basically, (laughs) the, the moral of the story of the book is this little boy decides that he's a walrus. Instead of his mom saying, okay, yeah, fine, honey, you're a walrus go come back when you're G.I. Joe or go play and you'll grow out of it. It's just a a whim of a child. The mom says, oh, we better take you to the doctor. And the doctor prescribes worms for him to eat because now he's a walrus. And then the doctor says, I better cut your hands into flippers because you're a walrus. And the mom says, yep, definitely. We better do that because you're a walrus. I'm affirming your walrus identity, to paraphrase. And um, it basically, it, it was the absurdity of, you know, medically transitioning children based on something they said to you one day. And um, the radical left, they decided to make sure that his book wasn't on Amazon and they tried to have it pulled down in all other places and Barnes and Noble. And naturally, the book just sold out. I'm still awaiting my copy. Um, and, uh, you know, it was the Streisand effect, Johnny the Walrus. Yeah. And it's five star rated. And uh, I kind of like the the foray of conservatives, especially conservative parents, um, creating content for children. And it's not even conservative content. It's just like, leave my kid alone. I've got my family, you do your family over there. Um, That's sort of the Mm -hmm. theme of uh, how conservatives think about the family. Um, But anyway, long Mm. story short, he went on to Dr. Phil. And if you don't pay attention to the audience, because this is a California audience that knew that Matt Walsh was coming. So the audience is stacked against him, against him. But if you don't listen to the audience and just listen to the left wing activist and Matt, the reasonable, unexcitable, conservative, so boring, he's excellent, um, versus the people who, on the other side, if you just disregard the audience, pay attention to that, you're like, oh my goodness, this is an axe murdering. <laughs> Matt Walsh murdered these people. I like to report a crime. Um, so maybe we can show <laughs> some of that if you wouldn't mind. That's a question I would like to throw out to you know, other members of the panel, actually, because just like the four-year-old can't answer what is a girl, well, this is one of the problems with this left-wing gender ideology is that no one who espouses it can even tell you what these words mean. It's like, what is a woman? Well, can you tell me what a woman is? No, I can't. Because but, it's not for me to say. I, womanhood looks different for everybody. What do, you, what do you define a woman as? An adult human female. 
And what does a female mean? Uh, well, well, that's how do you, how do you define a someone with, with female reproductive organs. Okay. Someone who's, you know, here's the thing. When you're, when you're female, it goes right down to your bones, your DNA. So that's why if someone dies, okay. we could dig up their bones 100 years from now. We have no idea what they believed in their head, but we can tell what sex they were okay. because it's, in, it's, down in, it's, it's in, ingrained in every fiber of their being. Interesting. So I'm trying to understand. Your definition is that a woman is someone who is female, you said, right? Correct. Your definition. Biological female. So what happens if we have maybe someone who is female, identifies as a woman, right? You know, cisgender woman, right? As you explained, as you just explained, but maybe doesn't have the ability to reproduce. Maybe it doesn't have those well, organs well, that you're talking about well, that are reproductive well, organs. I, mean, I have answered the question. You stood up here and said trans women are women. Yes. Tell me what you mean. What is a woman? Womanhood is something that, just as Ethan explained, I cannot define because I am not but myself. But you used well, the well, word. So what did you mean when you said trans women are women if you don't know what it means? Right. So here's the thing. So I do not define what a woman is because I do not identify as a woman. Womanhood is something that is an umbrella term. It includes people that who... That describes what? People who identify as a woman. <laughs> identify as what? As a woman. What is that? Was to each their own. Okay. Each woman, each man, each person Whoa. is going to have a different relation with their own gender identity and define it differently. That, that and so I'm trans women that. are women too. Okay. And you want to hold on, hold on. Trans you women are women. Reduce, you, listen, you won't listen, even tell me what the word reduce, means, though. So that's the problem. You want to reduce women. You want to reduce men down to maybe just their genetics, our genitals, no. our chromosomes, right? That's what you're what saying. You is that is that's what, what you, what you want to do is appropriate women. You want to appropriate womanhood okay. and turn it into basically a costume that can be worn. Do you know, do you know what? I just want to say, <laughs> um, there is, I, I, I don't know what you think about this, Sheila, but how offensive is that, that that person sat there and said, well, what about women who can't reproduce? I mean, can't, and basically saying that a woman who cannot reproduce is not a real woman. I mean, yeah. surely that is the pinnacle of offensiveness. Surely, if they want to talk offensive, surely that statement alone is enough for someone to go, hang on a minute, no, you're talking nonsense there. Like, just because something doesn't work automatically means you're not a real person. Like, that's because that's their definition of it, surely. So... That, that to me just screams, like you're delegitimizing women across the world by saying that. And that's, that's, yeah. so, that's so wrong. Yeah, the, it's, uh, they are taking women with a biological disorder. They're taking biological women, genetic women with uh -huh. a medical condition that causes infertility and lumping them in with the guys in a dress and high heels and drawn on eyebrows. That is truly offensive. Um, it, it's funny because as a woman, I've lived as a woman my whole life. I'm raising a couple of them. To see these two activists speak on behalf of me is mm -hmm. gross. You know, mm -hmm. in, in, further in this uh, appearance by Matt, um, they talk about, maybe Mr. Producer can bring it up. They talk about the issue of Loudoun County and transgender washrooms or open washrooms, sorry, that everybody can just, if you identify as a girl, you can go in the girl's bathroom. And Matt brings up what a security the issue this is for girls. And the professor, there's this weird professor lady with a really bad haircut. Normally, I don't judge because I have unruly hair, but hers is like she's obviously in a fight with her dad. That's why she did that to her hair. And um, she she basically says, well, I'm not sure if that's a safety issue. Right after Matt says, in Loudoun County, a girl was raped in the bathroom. Her dad was arrested at a school board meeting for even, even raising the issue. And this woman goes, I'm not sure. I'm not even sure if it's a safety issue. Well, it is for me and my girls, and it is for that dad in Loudoun County, and we can't even be critical of this issue because somebody then says, oh, it's a safety issue because you hurt my feelings, but girls are being raped in bathrooms, and that's not a security issue. That's not a safety issue. It's ridiculous. Well, exactly, and I think I think as well, Matt, Matt, Matt Walsh made the best um, uh, counter 
uh, argument there that we literally can dig up people, uh, well, I say women, um, who have died hundreds of years ago, and you do not even need to know what they were thinking just by forensical scientific um, analysis, you can determine what sex that person is. And that shows to you that it's not it's not just in your head um, of, of how it's measured. It's measured through genetics, DNA, chromosomes, um, and X, Y, and Z. And I think it, it's just, it's shocking that we've, that people have fallen to this idea of it's all based, or it's all measured around feeling. You can't, I don't think you can measure that. I don't think that's immeasurable. So it's almost now, um, it's it's such it's an issue that that is is really polarizing people and it's and it's and it's polarizing um uh, children as well and it's it's making children almost scared to even say hang on a minute well this doesn't seem right and that's what's worrying not being able to critique i think being able to critique an idea to for better ideas is how you move forward and it's almost like um, these people have made their mind up on on what they would like to believe, and they don't want anything else. So therefore, everyone else is wrong. Um, but yeah. I think the the pinnacle of that was um, was that person turning around and saying, "Yeah, well, what if a woman can't reproduce? What if their their sexual organs aren't um, aren't working? That means that they're they're essentially what they're saying is that means that they're not a real woman. That like." It's just that's so unbelievable. You may as well be a guy in a wig, is what they're saying. Yeah, yeah, unbelievable. Later on in that appearance, Matt made the point that there are, as I always call them, mediocre men stealing opportunities from girls, and and uh, the activist said, "Oh, look at him! You know, talking about how you know talking about women. Who does he think he is?" But you. Like, you're just a guy in makeup. <laughs> like, yeah, you don't get exactly. to speak for me either, but at least Matt is saying, uh, get out of girls' sports. This is deeply mm. personal for me because my daughter trains probably eight days a week. She plays high-level competitive rugby at an international level. Um, mm. But as Mr. Producer brought up, she can train eight days a week. She's in the gym. She's lifting. She's running. She's tackling. She's running drills all the time. Serious about her nutrition. She's 15. But those 15-year-old boys are much bigger, much bigger than her. And mm -hmm. two things are going to happen if things are allowed to proceed the way they are. A mediocre boy who's flunked out of the national team program is going to take her spot on the girls' team as we see all the time in uh, swimming these days. They're just swimming, cycling, weightlifting, flunk out of the male stuff and just go over and steal a spot from a girl who's worked really hard for it. Or her career is going to be ended because she's going to be across the scrum um, from a, a boy who identifies as a girl and she's going to receive a serious injury. And uh, if this if this madness is going to continue... That's what we're facing in my family. But it's going to be faced by every family with a high-level female athlete. This is truly the end of female sports, unless we put a marker down and say this is crazy enough is enough. But we cannot feel yeah. our way out of biology. It doesn't change. Exactly. Whatever that young man feels inside of his body and however he lives his life outside of his sport, I don't care. I can't be bothered yeah. to care. I'm too busy driving my 15-year-old to training. But it doesn't change the fact that he has undergone male puberty, and that increases muscle mass, uh, bone mass, growth, everything that my daughter will not, and it's not fair. Yeah. There's got to be a different solution. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you couldn't have said it better. And uh, I, I'll be honest, I don't even think I've got anything to add to that because you've said it said it perfectly so perfect yeah. um, let's just let's yeah maybe let's uh let's oh we've gone long on uh, youtube so that's great but we are uh, i think going to sign off of youtube and encourage our people who are watching us on youtube to join us on rumble odyssey or super you we're going to continue the conversation which is going to get dangerous at least according to um youtube standards we're going to be talking about hate facts 
<laughs> and conspiracy facts, <laughs> not conspiracy theories. So if you wouldn't mind joining us on one of those other platforms, and we are going to continue the dangerous conversation over there. And Mr. Producer will let me know when we're all clear. All clear. Okay. We are. Clear? All clear. Okay, perfect.